my name is Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Today we will be discussing a book I recently reviewed for Green Left titled Environmental Anarchy, Security in the 21st Century, written by Professor Mark Beeson and published by Bristol University Press in 2021. It's a forensic analysis of the national and international security implications of climate change and discusses, amongst many other things, why alternative models and economic models are so hard to achieve, even when solutions are readily available. Mark Beeson is Professor of International Politics at the University of Western Australia and has had a distinguished academic career working all over the world. His work is centred on the politics, economics and security of the Asia-Pacific region. His articles are widely published and he is the author of 22 books. The latest of which is Environmental Anarchy, Security in the 21st Century. It is latest and he's joining us from Perth today to talk some more about it. Mark Beeson, thanks so much for joining Green Left. Thanks for having me, Suzanne. Mark, I said in my review of the book that it's not only an international relations text, but it's also a forensic analysis of the security implications of climate change. The book also states we have, what, less than 10 years of being able to successfully address it. Um, your previous books, such as Rethinking Global Governance and Institutions in the Asia-Pacific, focus more on the economic, developmental and military geopolitics of international relations and less on the biosphere and the environment. Environmental anarchy, security in the 21st century, while covering off on all those things, it is also very much a green book, if I can put it that way. What compelled you to write this particular book now? And what are you hoping it will achieve, particularly outside of the academic sphere? Uh, well, as far as why did I write it's concerned, I think part of it was uh, a sort of personal therapeutic process for me, because I think lots of us feel that we'd like to do something and it's not obvious what we can do. And for me, as a sort of professional academic, it's my modest contribution to trying to do something. And I hang out with young students all the time, and some of them are a bit depressed and fed up about the whole thing. So I thought I'd try and write something that at least address these kinds of things, even if it wasn't uh, radiantly optimistic. And as far as what I hoped uh, might happen, of course, I hoped that policymakers around the world would read the book and suddenly have a collective epiphany about what they ought to do and how they should change the world. But my realistic expectations are that no policymakers anywhere would read the book and it would have absolutely no influence whatsoever, sadly. But I mean, that's the kind of nature of things. There's quite a lot of good uh, information about what's going on in the world and the effects of climate change that's already out there. And I'm not gonna add anything to that, but except to try and highlight the urgency and the, the lack of imagination that characterizes so many policymakers around the world and the way that they approach these things. So, uh, so a combination of reasons, but I wasn't expecting it to change the world, unfortunately. Well, it certainly changed me reading it. It took me <laughs> right down a rabbit hole that I never expected to find myself in. So well done, you. Thank you. Now, as I also said in the review, it opens with a very 2021 question being, what does it mean to be secure? You then launch into a fairly forensic study of the various factors influencing that and the security governance and its implications. Um, it talks a lot about the increasingly entrenched poverty and inequality that's making our relationship with the natural world so toxic. It also quotes a poll that says the percentage of people that say they now feel safe has tanked from 90% to less than 50 in just 10 years. Mm. Uh, that's, the, that's a fairly um, controversial statistic. I mean, that. That's a big drop. People are now more concerned about pandemics and water shortages than what they are about China and other foreign powers. So do you believe climate change is a bigger risk than, say, the risk of Australia getting dragged into another war by the US alliance, this time with China? I do, uh, and uh, because for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, war is always, theoretically at least, avoidable, and one of the most striking uh, empirical realities of the last 50 years or so is that interstate war is very, very rare. There's lots of conflict and chaos in the world, no doubt, but it's often or generally within national borders. And major interstate war is very unusual these days. And that's a very encouraging uh, development, no doubt. And so the, the point to make is that we can't avoid war if we collectively 
put our minds to it and uh, behave in particular sorts of ways. The difference with uh, climate change, I think, is that uh, it's, uh, it's coming towards us very rapidly. And unless we do something remarkable, unprecedented, uh, and on a fairly epic scale uh, in a collaborative manner, then, then it's going to get much worse. And there's no real doubt about that. And the, the scientific evidence, I think, is just unambiguous and, and uh, evident before our eyes these days. So, so I think there, there is a big difference. But what's interesting, I think, is that, as I say, we have the opportunity to influence events. But the problem for countries like Australia, in my view, is that I don't think it needs to get dragged into any conflict, despite the number it's taken part in over the last 50 years or so. It chooses to ally itself very closely with the United States for, I think, misguided strategic reasons. Uh, and that makes it more vulnerable to being involved in these kinds of conflicts. And Peter Dutton's recent remarks about the need to st stand up to China and things highlight that kind of thing. In my view, what Australia should be doing as a so-called middle power is trying to encourage uh, other kinds of responses by the great powers, China and the United States in particular, to act more cooperatively uh, and to think about prioritizing climate change over traditional security issues. Because in my view, uh, climate change is a much more direct and important threat to both China and the United States than, is, than they are to each other. So, uh, so I think that's, that's something we need to take seriously. And the encouraging news is that even at the height of the Cold War, they managed, the United States and uh, the Soviet Union managed to negotiate arms control agreements. And there's no reason why China and the United States with the right kind of leadership and willingness couldn't do something similar, similar now. Absolutely. Peter Dutton giving rogue addresses at the press gallery certainly doesn't help. You talk a lot in the book about local and global economics and how inequality in all its forms is what causes the tension, as you put it, between political rhetoric and reality. You said in a book, and I quote, capitalism is predicated on the hierarchical division of labour and exploitation that presupposes in finite growth that is in reality impossible. At the risk of sounding like a realist myself, which you talk at some length about in the book, The Model of Realism, it seems equally impossible to visualise the fall of capitalism, I guess, or even a major paradigm shift in the right direction that would facilitate the massive social and economic reset that would be required, as you said in your last answer. It, it, it's a massive shift indeed that would have to happen. So what do you say to young people and students you mentioned earlier who have given up hope? I mean, what can the average person in the street do that can help make a genuine contribution, especially when our so-called political leaders here are so hell-bent on spending entire budgets on fossil fuels? Uh, well, I think it, it, is a, it is a challenge. There's no doubt about that. And uh, trying to think of the sorts of things that we can do and the individual impact that we can have is very challenging. We can do all the kind of normal things about recycling and uh, behaving responsibly and those kinds of things. But I think one of the major things that we can do is to, uh, to take part in uh, doing whatever you can, uh, wherever you can. And that's my kind of mantra these days. Uh, and it's not a terribly original kind of idea, but I think it's an important one that we should try and act where we are. And in Australia's case, of course, uh, it seems to me that we need to encourage our government to behave well as well, because uh, there's not much point in pontificating about what the rest of the world should do if we're not behaving terribly well. And Australia is something of an outlier now in terms of its behaviour uh, and uh, the attitudes of our government to cooperative action to address climate change. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try and firstly recognise what the issues are and the seriousness of the issues, and then to encourage our, our government to behave in a different kind of way. And uh, the challenges here are pretty enormous, but I think taking part in political activity uh, with other like-minded people is again, at least kind of therapeutic because it reminds you that you're not on your own. You are part of a larger movement. Uh, there's something good about just interacting with members of your sort of tribe and like-minded people. So I think that has a has a, a useful and unifying kind of purpose. I mean, you may not be able to change the world immediately, but it's striking that there are a few people around, you know, Greta Thunberg and the school, school kids strike actions, 
being the most interesting and important in many ways, where uh, you know normally powerless young people have been able to mobilize, to articulate kinds of ideas about uh, what should be done, but they think rightly, in my view, that the older generation and the current generation of power holders haven't really addressed in a serious way. Uh, and they've been able to call them out and to put some pressure on them. And there has been some modest responses. And I think for all COP26's uh, apparent failures in some people's views, at least it happened, at least there was a meeting, at least policymakers felt obliged to at least mouth the rhetoric of doing something about this. I mean, clearly there's a big gap between rhetoric and reality in the case of the Australian government, but at the very least there was something kind of interesting going on there. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's useful uh, and important. And I think the, the, you know, the, the really big challenge, I think, for all of us and for governments as well, is to begin to uh, prioritise collective interests over individual or national ones. And uh, as far as policymakers are concerned all over the world, and our government is not unique in this, uh, they still think about what's good for their electorate or the people they claim to represent, and they tend to privilege their interests over everybody else's. And I think that's hard for countries to get around, it's hard for individuals to get around, because the first thing that lots of people want to do if and when the plague passes, of course, is to jump on a plane and fly off somewhere and have a holiday and a good time. And I don't blame them, but it's uh, symbolic of the kind of challenge that we face in changing our own behavior and the way that we think about the world as well. So it's a, it's a complex, uh, set of challenges. But I think the good news is that you know, even some unlikely uh, people, uh, now the National Farmers Federation, for example, is now kind of on board with the idea that climate change is real, that the government should be doing something about it. So even in some of the formerly very conservative political electorates and communities, uh, there's a realization now that there's something really big and important going on. And if we don't do something about it in the fairly near future, then things don't look terribly good. That brings me to my um, last question I was going to ask you, actually, in relation to the rash of independent and new candidates we're seeing in New South Wales and federally at the moment, people like Zoe Daniels and the Greens have always done so, but a lot of new independents that are very happy to stand on a policy platform of climate change. And a lot of people are good and cheese that the Morrison government so comprehensively failed to address it, even as an issue in the electorate, let alone at action level. Um, does that indicate to you, given that it's your area of expertise, psychology and politics and how people vote, does that indicate to you that significant progress has been made and that it's now no longer a career killer in Canberra to say that you stand up for climate change? Yeah. No, possibly so. I mean, it remains to be seen. There have been some uh, encouraging signs and there have been a number of independents uh, elected to Parliament on a sort of pro-environmental, more progressive set of uh, issues and agenda, and that's uh, encouraging. But even though those people are around now, uh, the question is, are enough people going to vote for them to get them over the line? Will that catch on in more the sort of conservative areas I was talking about? Uh, before? Uh, and will people be prepared to uh, make the kinds of uh, personal sacrifices and concessions that might be necessary to do something on the scale uh, that's necessary to make a difference? So, I mean, if you stood for Parliament saying that, uh, I'm, you know, we're going to put up taxes to help restructure the economy, we're going to uh, redirect some of the money that we raise to foreigners and other parts of the world because they're living in desperate straits and didn't do much to create the problem. Uh, it's hard to know how well that kind of agenda would go over with uh, ordinary voters because at the last election, to be fair, the Labour Party did go to the election with a sort of more progressive uh, agenda, particularly as far as taxation was concerned, and they got thumped by the electorate who weren't interested or willing to put uh, their own, in, own interests uh, behind uh, those of people they don't even know or haven't even met. So I think that kind of change of consciousness that's required to get people to think about this particular problem in a new kind of way is an enormous challenge. If you're an optimist, 
the fact that we're kind of allegedly all in this together and we can't uh, fix the problem unless we all act collectively in some way because nobody's going to be able to insulate themselves from the effect of this. Uh, that's potentially a good thing, but it requires everybody to take the idea seriously and it requires uh, political leaders to uh, actually show some leadership and be willing to cooperate in the first place. And I think that's the noticeable thing that's missing at the moment, that there isn't uh, the willingness to try to come up with a new, more collaborative and cooperative agenda. And there aren't the kind of, uh, there isn't a kind of imagination to think about what that agenda might actually look like. And I mentioned, for example, uh, arms control treaties that were negotiated during the Cold War, and which surprised everybody. I mean, China and the United States could do precisely the same sort of thing now, and the money they save could be used uh, in restructuring their domestic economies and other people's along green, sustainable lines. I mean, it's not an inconceivable idea in theory. Uh, in practice, obviously, it's a lot more difficult. But I think that's the nature of the kind of challenge that we face. And I think this obsession with a rather old-fashioned traditional view of security and geopolitics that's more reminiscent of the 19th century or the mid 20th century than it is of the kind of circumstances that we face today. I don't it's think it's either appropriate or helpful. It's difficult, isn't it, when people, to ask people at household level to change their behaviour as consumers, when we see such massive corporate and government corruption, we've had illegal water buybacks, we've had tens of billions of dollars of taxpayers' money siphoned off to gas companies. We've had royal commissions that went nowhere for everyone from the banks to the gas industry to aged care. And, and all these enormously profitable businesses are basically stealing our water and fouling the air and getting away with it because of the way the government handles things. And it's a bit hard to expect people at household level to feel positive about the input that they have. How do you, how do you answer that? Well, I think by trying to, uh, without sounding patronising at all about this, I hope, uh, I mean, I think part of the challenge is to kind of explain the relationship between politics uh, and economic and social outcomes at the national level and at the transnational level as well. And the last mm. is a very big ask. But even at the national level, uh, I think people need to recognise that uh, left to their own devices, some political parties and political actors uh, will always act to serve what they take to be their interests uh, and their vision of uh, how to run countries at particular times. I think the big question mark now is whether some of the people in positions of power in this country and many others quite get what a dramatic and uh, serious situation we find ourselves in now and the limited amount of time available to us to do something about it. So I'm not advocating that people at the kind of uh, less fortunate end of the economic spectrum in particular should be expected to do all the heavy lifting uh, to do this. In fact, quite the, quite the contrary. Some of that money that we might raise through effective taxation, for example, at the domestic and the international level could be redirected to people who are not very well off. And this is even truer in places like the United States, where entrenched poverty is much worse than it is here and yet they have a political system that is even more dysfunctional uh, than ours. And there are real questions about the uh, continuation of uh, de democratic politics in the United States as a consequence of those things. So again, the stakes are pretty high, but I think the challenge for effective political leadership is to articulate what the nature of the problems actually is, uh, what the kind of relationships are that have led us to be where we are at this point particular historical juncture and the sorts of things that we need to think seriously about, no matter how uh, unlikely they may seem at this moment in time, but the sorts of things we need to, to think about to actually begin addressing these uh, problems at the domestic level first, no doubt, because otherwise it's going to be a hard political sell, but also thinking about this wider context. And that's the real challenge to recognise that if we are to, quote unquote, save the planet, then it's a big place. And some people uh, in places like Africa have done very little to create the problem of climate change, but they are on the sharp end of its destructive impacts. 
and they're voting with their feet. And I'm not entirely surprised by this. I mean, if I was uh, impoverished, living in Africa, no job, no hope, no prospects, I'd vote with my feet and try and go somewhere else and maybe try to go to Europe, despite the dangers and the likelihood of a uh, not very happy welcome when I got there. But that's the kind of challenges that we face and connecting the dots and making people realize that uh, it is an unprecedented and uh, un frankly unlikely set of challenges that we face in our ability to meet them. But if we don't give it a go, we're definitely not going to meet them. And I think that's the yes. kind of that's the kind of bottom line. But until local policymakers get this and start articulating a different set of priorities and a different vision, then I think the, the you know the prospects aren't fantastic. It has to be said. Now your book covers an awful lot of ground. <clears throat> Pardon me. It was a sociology lesson. It was definitely an international security lesson for me. It was a history lesson concerning the history of conflicts in our regions and beyond. Um, you talked about US politics, Brexit, Trump. You didn't talk a lot about Australia's standing in all of this. Now, I wonder if that was because in the greater scheme of things, you're actually not all that relevant in an international policy sense because we're riding on the coattails of the toxic alliance with the US. Is that accurate or is there other reasons for that? Well, well I think Australia isn't that important in the global scheme of things, I don't think. Or, although it could be more important. This is the point I was making about uh, so-called creative middle power diplomacy earlier on. Uh, I think if Australia wanted to, I mean, the, you know, the bottom line is if Australia can't respond effectively, creatively, thoughtfully and generously to this particular challenge, why would we expect India, Pakistan, Sudan, Ethiopia, or any of these countries to respond effectively and creatively? Because their problems are infinitely more demanding and challenging and immediate than ours are. And we have the wealth, the capacity, uh, the intellectual uh, capital to be able to do something useful and creative about this. So if we can't do it, I don't see why we'd expect anybody else to do it. And that's why it's so important, I think, to try and get momentum in a country like Australia, where we do have the possibility to have an immediate impact. I mean, in my view, uh, what we should do is to shut down the coal, immediate, uh, coal industry virtually overnight, if we can do it, or as soon as possible. And clearly there will be some casualties from this in terms of jobs lost in particular areas, but Australia is a rich enough country to be able to compensate the losers from this dramatic transformation uh, of our economic structure uh, in a way that other countries can't. And uh, just stopping those exports of coal uh, would push up the price of coal around the world, no doubt. But that's part of what capitalism is supposed to be about, sending market signals about uh, areas of economic activity that are no longer viable or desirable. So, I mean, I've you know, got reservations about whether capitalism uh, is a viable long-term way of economic uh, organizing economic activity around the world, because it does create formidable problems of its own. And you can't have a, a system that's based on endless consumption uh, in, a, in a finite world. It's as simple as that. So there are problems about that. Then there are problems about the enormous levels of inequality that it generates within countries and between countries. And that's something that needs to be addressed as well. And I, you know, my guess is for what it's worth, that if we are to kind of survive and if civilization uh, worthy of the name is to continue in some form or other, then we're probably gonna have a, a social system that looks a bit more like a socialist uh, social system than it does a capitalist one because uh, Capitalism, I think we know some of the problems with that. Certainly there have been problems with uh, forms of quote unquote socialism. There's a big question mark about whether that's what they actually were, of course, but uh, mm -hmm. the socialism doesn't have a good historical track record, but neither does capitalism because it's, you know, whatever we're doing at the moment uh, is causing the kind of problems that we see around us. So, you know, we just got to change some fairly fundamental things if we're to have a hope of addressing some of these problems. And none of it's going to be easy. All of it's going to be unprecedented. And frankly, a lot of it is pretty unimaginable and I'm not wildly optimistic, but I think recognizing the extent and the nature and the scale of the challenge is the first step. And then having a serious discussion uh, at somewhere like the UN and at somewhere like COP26 about what's actually going to be done on a cooperative basis. And at the moment, I think that failure of follow through 
or institutionalized cooperation between the major powers. That's one of the big shortcomings, I think, in actually doing something effective. But even to suggest such a thing would have people thinking that you're flaky and uh, not entirely serious because it seems so unlikely. But, uh, but I know on the flip side, the European Union, for all its current problems, demonstrates that it's possible to pacify the most violent part of the planet bar none, uh, institute peace for 60 or 70 years, institute economic prosperity, and have Europeans thinking about each other, with the exception of Britain, of course, uh, as somebody they could never fall out with in a very serious way or disagree with. But even the European Union is being undermined by some of the current problems associated with climate change, the sort of mass migration towards Europe being the most obvious and visible part of that. But, but that's what we need to be thinking about and aiming for, in my view. I think that kind of institutionalized forms of cooperation that actually have the capacity to make a difference. Speaking of scale, your book also covers a lot of scientific ground. You talk about climate science, you talk about social science, you talk about political science, and even quantum physics. So how long does it take to write a book like that? I mean, it's a relatively short book in length for the amount of ground that it covers, and it has a lot of a very high-level academic content, but it's also very readable in the sense that there's a lot of information in there that's quite topical and up-to-date with Brexit and Trump and the climate crisis, etc. How long does it take to write something like that? Well, in some ways, it's taken however long I've been an academic. So that's about 25 mm. years or something. So uh, so you, you do build up a bit of intellectual capital and you do know a bit of stuff. I mean, you may not know quite what it means or what to do with it, or you may not be able to make entire sense of it, but you do know something. And so you've got something to draw on and you know what some of the issues are. And then trying to say something about them is kind of what I do in my day job or used to. And uh, so I've got an idea how to go about it and how to organise a story like that uh, in some ways. So the, the writing process, and I quite enjoy writing, and I'm a bit of a self-confessed windbag when it comes to writing. So, uh, so I've never found that a problem. Uh, so I, I quite enjoy it. I find it, as I say, slightly therapeutic to do this sort of thing. Uh, so it didn't take, you know, I can't remember how long, but you know, less than six months. So, uh, but, I, but I had quite a lot of material to draw on and think about. So, uh, but yeah, it's just trying to, I mean, you feel compelled to say something cheery and optimistic. And I found it very difficult to do so as the last part of the book sort of indicates, this is my confessions of a reluctant realist section. And it's not because I think realism's a good explanation of the world or it's something that we should uh, draw on in terms of our ideas about policy, far from it, in fact, because it's a recipe for disaster in many ways and deeply pessimistic. But the, but the, the reality is that uh, many policymakers, if you ask them to describe themselves, they consider themselves to be realists and many of their advisors do. And they think that their counterparts in other parts of the world are just as sort of duplicitous, untrustworthy and mean-spirited as they are. So therefore, people like Peter Dutton, I mean, he thinks that his counterpart in uh, Beijing is just like him and he's probably right. Uh, and he's probably, you know, his counterpart is probably not to be trusted and probably has a mean spirited view of the world and a zero sum view of the world as well. But the challenge is to influence the debate in ways that make it clear that people like Dutton have got nothing to offer when it comes to thinking about, quote unquote, saving the planet or even having more cordial relations with a country, China, that's going to dominate this part of the world. Uh, one way or another. And the challenge is to make sure that if China is part of the, uh, the future of this part of the world, which it undoubtedly will be for good or bad, to try and make sure that it's a, a useful, engaged actor that we can uh, cooperate with when it comes to these kinds of issues. We're never going to see eye to eye with them on everything, no doubt, about authoritarianism and non-democratic practices and doing dreadful things to the Uyghurs and all of that kind of stuff is always going to be a problem. But that doesn't mean to say we've either got to think about or actually go to war with them uh, to stop it. So I don't think we're in a situation like we were in 1938 or 39. Xi Jinping is not Adolf Hitler. Uh, he may not be the most pleasant chap in the world and he may be doing dreadful things to the Uyghurs, but uh, it's not kind of that existential crisis at this stage, I think. So we've got to try and 
learn to work with China. US and China have got to have a working relationship as well. And it's just more important than sort of striking attitudes and being hairy chested in Canberra, I think. Yeah, the old style politics is definitely starting to wear thin and he's hoping it's in its death throes indeed. Professor Beeson, thank you so much for your time today, joining us from the University of Western Australia. Congratulations on your recent academic retirement. Look forward to reading your biography in the future. <laughs> thanks very much, Suzanne. Ple pleasure being with you anyway. Thanks very much. Okay. Don't go away. Stay right there. We'll get back to you. Okay. That was Mark Beeson, author of Environmental Anarchy, Security in the 21st Century, available now from Bristol University Press. You can read my book review, which is also on... Well, on one of those days, you know. Sorry. <clears throat> you can read Even my book... The world's not easy. You can read my book review, watch this interview or on video or listen to the podcast at greenleft.org.au. This is Suzanne Jane for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.